Good evening. Welcome, one and all. It's great to see so many friends here, some people I haven't seen in quite a long while. So thank you for coming out for our April program featuring one of the most extraordinary TV broadcasting pioneers in Texas history, Bobby Wygant. Bobby has been absolutely tireless carrying out all sorts of media interviews leading up to this evening's presentation, including a KERA interview today. And we are most thankful to her and her publisher, editor, Christina Patoski. And our museum team has loved working with both of you so much uh, over the last couple of months. It's been a huge honor. And I'd like to acknowledge especially a fellow Leadership Texas classmate, Carolyn Razor, a former TV KXAS anchor and reporter who encouraged us to host Bobby Wagant and promote her book, Talking to the Stars. Without her, I would not have known about the book's release. So, Carolyn, thank you so much. Where are you? My name is Nicola Longford, CEO of the Sixth Floor Museum. And in conjunction with the temporary exhibit 55 Years, which is composed of 57 magazine covers of President Kennedy's image depicted right after his death in 1963 to the present, emphasizing the powerful impressions of the printed magazine cover in the pop cultural world of image and myth making. Tonight's conversation rather focuses on a different aspect of journalism history, the dawn of television. The role TV has played in shaping our understanding of access to news of all kinds, the public fascination with celebrity, and a fascinating look at the 70-year career of a legendary reporter. Tonight, you will be taken on a wonderfully inspiring journey through time to reflect upon the fearless and elegant path that Bobby Wygant paved for women in an overwhelmingly male-dominated industry and to come right back to the present and reflect upon how radically the world has changed with regard to how we engage in the many different media formats popular today. Stephen Fagan, curator, oral historian, and author of Assassination and Commemoration, JFK Dallas and the Sixth Floor Museum at Dealey Plaza. I'm shameless promoter. This has just been released in paperback. He will engage our guest in a very fun and riveting excursion together. They will revisit seminal historical moments over the last 70 years. But before you put on your seatbelts and join the ride, please join me in thanking Visit Dallas for their very generous support of the 55 Years exhibit and the related programming. Thank you, Visit Dallas. Now please welcome Texas legend Bobby Wygant and curator Stephen Fagan. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here tonight. This is uh, going to be a lot of fun. We have a lot of ground to cover. Uh, on the uh, screens on either side of us, you'll be seeing a rotation of images uh, from Bobby's career, all of which come from her book, uh, Talking to the Stars. And uh, it was hard to choose just a few images to share with you because it is a remarkable career that spans seven decades of, of, of television history. But really, tonight, Bobby, I want to start with something that goes even farther back than that because this year... 2019 marks the 80th anniversary of your first time in front of a live TV camera. That happened in New York. Tell us a little bit about that. That was in 1939 in New York City. My grandparents had taken me on a, a little vacation tour, and we were there for the World's Fair. And um, so uh, one of the side ventures was to go to uh, RCA building, uh, 30 Rock, and to uh, see this wonderful new experimental thing called television. And uh, they had a setup where people could stand in front of the camera and talk to the camera, and then there were monitors where uh, other people could watch or you could see yourself on television. So my granddad was a big Irishman, over six feet tall, with big shock of, of snow white hair, very outgoing man, and uh, 
he was only too glad to get in front of that TV camera and tell them who he was and where he was from. And he was from Lafayette, Indiana, the home of Purdue University. And, you know, he did a whole number for Purdue. And uh, then he said, and this is my little granddaughter. And he brings me up in front of the camera. And I knew that granddad always expected me to follow suit. You know, if he laid the groundwork, I was to follow suit. So I said, my name is Roberta Connolly, and I'm from Lafayette, Indiana, and I'm 12 years old. And, uh, and I, you know, said I like this and I like that. And then finally, I guess someone got the hook and got both of us away, <laughs> <laughs> away from the camera, but that was my television debut. 80 years 1939. ago. 1939. And was that where the, the seed was planted? Because you, you majored in broadcasting. Was it that moment at the World's Fair that, that said, yeah, I kind of like being in front of a camera? I, I don't think so, not really, because uh, that came later. Uh, maybe back in the recess of some place of my brain, it, it had some <laughs> effect, but um, no, uh, when I was, uh, oh, I would say, uh, starting maybe eighth grade and on into high school, I wanted to be a doctor. And I was very serious about that. And I uh, met several times with a woman doctor in our hometown and talked with her about school and, and how you mix family. And you know, uh, she was married to a doctor and had two children. And uh, the thing that got me away from that was, uh, and thinking about broadcasting, was when I was 16 years old, my mother died, and um, um, I, I, I was so traumatized by that that I didn't think that I could be a doctor. And uh, I wasn't mature enough to understand about death and so forth. And uh, then I was uh, beginning to be very much aware of Purdue University's radio station, which covered the whole state of Indiana and surrounding states. And they had woman announcers. And uh, then I, I was always uh, okay getting in front of a class and giving uh, programs and things. So um, I started thinking about that. My granddad knew one of the deans at Purdue and when I was a senior in high school, he took me to talk with this dean, and he said, uh, uh, you know, this is the kind of student we like, and, and uh, I, the way it was paved for me to come to Purdue and major in broadcasting. Right. And you get your degree in broadcasting, and then you come to Texas in 1947. What, what brings you here? I was a, a bride. I came with my husband. <laughs> Uh, my husband, Phil Wygant, uh, was graduated from Purdue one semester ahead of me, also a broadcasting major. And he came to Texas to help his friend, Tex McCormick, uh, bring his car back to Texas. And so they were in Fort Worth, and uh, his friend kept saying, well, you're looking for a job, why don't you look here? And Phil said, well, this is a huge market, I'm just out of college, they're not going to want some kid just out of college. And uh, so anyway, his friend kept needling him. And he went to the smallest radio station in Fort Worth at the time, which was KXOL. He went there, uh, the manager auditioned him and said, uh, I would give you a job, uh, I would hire you, but I have no openings at the moment. He said, let me get on the telephone and call some people. So he called Frank Mills, who was the chief announcer at WBAP and said, Frank, I have this young man from Purdue University, a broadcasting major, looking for a job. I don't have any openings. Would you be interested in seeing him? And Frank said, send him out. Frank auditioned him and then started kind of talking like he was going to offer him a job. And uh, so my husband said, uh, well, there's just one thing. He said, I'm engaged to be married in June this was in February, and he said, that, that can't be changed. And Frank said, well, I think we could give you a couple of days off to go home and get married. So uh, we got married and, and uh, came back, and uh, I've been in Texas ever since. 
you, you came to Texas like two days after you got married, right? Yes, yes. Wow. Yes, I was married on Saturday, and Monday I was in Texas. <laughs> so WBAP, the first TV station in Texas, first in the Southwest, goes on the air in September of 1948, and you joined the station two weeks before it goes on the air. Yes. And, and you were hired to do uh, continuity. Why don't you yes. explain to us what continuity is? Continuity uh, covers a variety <laughs> of sins. <laughs> continuity, anything that has to be written, uh, intros to programs, content for programs, commercials, uh, that, that fell in, under continuity. And uh, so I, of course, had been trained writing at Purdue. At, at Purdue, I was on the student staff of the radio station. It had a professional staff and a student staff, and I was on the student staff. And uh, so we did everything. And uh, so that, that was my first job. But in addition to continuity, you would frequently get called upon in those early days to, to go on camera and help out. Yeah, you know, it was a wonderful thing, Stephen, that uh, in those days we were a very small staff uh, and very integrated. Uh, you, you know, uh, we, we didn't, uh, you're, you're a, a producer, you know, you don't do anything but produce it. And, no matter what your title was, you might just do anything. And anybody could be called to get in front of the camera and do something. And uh, so, uh, uh, and ideas were welcome. Uh, you know, if you had an idea for a program, because whatever was done locally was, was live. And we did have uh, programs from the network, but uh, the programs that we did were, were live programs. And uh, if you had an idea for a program, you could present it, and uh, they'd kind of see if it would work. And so it was, uh, it was very kind of loose, but wonderful, wonderful. A lot, of, a lot of musical programs, dancing programs, and the children's puppet programs in those early days, from yes. what I understand. Yes. Uh, the big hit was the barn dance. And, uh, where dance clubs would come out, and you know we had this massive studio, and you could put, uh, you know, uh, maybe four sets of square dancers, and you could have a band back here, and you could have stuff going on over here, and uh, you, you know the the studio was large and it could accommodate all that, and it was very colorful. But, uh, in the beginning, of course, we weren't color. But when we did go color, it was, that was really sold a lot of color TV sets. Well, well, speaking of color, WBAP was the first in Texas to go color. And Absolutely. that was in 1954. Yes, 1954. That's extraordinary, 1954. Yes. And, and as I understand it, at the time you guys went to color, there were about 120 TV sets in your broadcasting range that were actually color TVs? Yeah, that was probably a padded figure. <laughs> <laughs> it's extraordinary to imagine that you were there on November 22nd, 1963, broadcasting in color to those few TV sets out there that could actually watch you, uh, watch you that way. November 22nd was your birthday. My 37th birthday. You were live? If you're doing the math, I'm 92. <laughs> <laughs> you were live on the air that day, uh, 12.30 to 1 o'clock on the show Dateline. Let's set the stage a little bit. You took over uh, Dateline in 1960. Tell us a little bit about what Dateline was. Dateline was conceived by the director of broadcasting, who was also the head of circulation for the Fort Worth Star-Telegram. His name was Harold Huff. And he decided that they needed to sell more color TV sets. They weren't, well, they were expensive. It was one of the reasons they weren't a hot item. Everybody wanted one, but couldn't afford it. And uh, so anyway, he said, we've got to do programming to get people interested in buying TV, color TV. So uh, he came up with this idea. He said, ladies like fashions, and ladies like colorful fashions. And we should put on a daily fashion show and uh, get the ladies to watching and wanting a color TV. And so they started this program. And, and they called it Dateline, which has nothing to do with the Dateline on NBC now. <laughs> but we were a, 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 just a talk show and a, and a 
daytime variety show. They asked uh, uh, this uh, woman, Lynn Trammell, who was uh, head of our film department, anything that was being broadcast on film uh, went through her department. And she had a wonderful voice, and she did a poetry po program on radio for years. She just had one of those beautiful voices, and a wonderful woman, very capable. And uh, so they said, uh, uh, Lynn, the, we're getting department stores to furnish the models and the clothing and the fashions, and uh, uh, they'll finish a, uh, furnish a script, and we want you to come and voice the script. So she would go down on her lunch hour and do this voiceover uh, for the fashion show. Then uh, it got to the point where they needed somebody to uh, help with interviews. There was an announcer usually scheduled uh, to help on the program. And uh, she was saying, you know, I'm running the film department. This is not what I do. Then one morning, uh, the program director, Bob Gould, came into my office and he said, in, we're into the continuity office, and said, um, uh, we need you to go out and do the Dateline program today. Lynn is ill and cannot be here. 30 minutes before it was to go on, I got that announcement. He said, go back and the director will tell you what to do. I go back to Sid Smith, the director. I said, and so what are we doing today? And he said, I don't know, we'll see who shows up. <laughs> <laughs> so we did the program, somehow we got through it. And the only uh, comment or the, uh, the most uh, frequent comment they had about me doing the show was they said, would somebody please get a cushion or something for her? She looks like a puppet sitting behind that desk. <laughs> so they got two yellow pages, telephone directories. And I, I sat on those two books for days, and if not months, until they reached something that would get me up higher where I could be seen. Anyway, um, it turned out she had the flu, and um, af after a few days, she phoned in and she said, Bobby seems a natural for that show. Why don't you get her to do it full time? Let me go back to my film department. So that's how I got Dateline full time. Right. And you weren't just the host. You were also the producer of Dateline. Yes. Um, as, uh, as I got into it, um, the director had been doing some of the producing, but he got off duty at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, and so all the calls were coming to me anyway. So again, Bob Gould, the program director, said, we're making you the producer. So I was the producer. Uh, I was the uh, writer, anything that had to be written. I did my own research and, uh, and, and, ran, and still ran the copy department. <laughs> and so you would actually call people up. You would book your own guests. Yes, yes. Now, the word got around, and uh, I, I will have to say that um, you know, calls were coming to us. It wasn't like I was out knocking on doors right. every day. Uh, but nonetheless, they had to be dealt with, and, and we, we generally had about four things, four to five things on each program. And you would interview celebrities and politicians and circus performers and chefs and clergymen and sometimes even animals? Oh, yeah, animals. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I remember. Uh, we had the Shrine and Circus people come, and they brought this little baby elephant, and uh, they said that they, it's no problem. You know, they kept assuring the director that he wasn't going to run him amok, and you know, Trump uh, 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 go trembling. Uh, what am I trying to say? Trampling over the uh, the equipment. <laughs> so um, we were standing there doing the interview and baby elephants okay and then all of a sudden it decided it wants to put its foot on top of my foot and it just goes <laughs> and, and I did the whole interview with with the elephant standing on my foot <laughs> <laughs> I had a couple of dogs one time uh, the hunting dogs we were doing a feature <laughs> and uh, the dogs were fine before we went on the air and uh, as soon as I started the intro into the segment, 
uh, the two dogs looked at one another and went, right, and they just went ballistic. <laughs> And then, you know, halfway through it, that all we could do was just laugh. And the two men, the two handlers, were, you know, hanging on to the dogs, and, and uh, you know, just live, live TV. Right. And you would do your own commercials in between the guest segments. I did some commercials, not all, but I did some commercials. Yeah. Yes, and uh, I remember um, one of the most memorable commercial uh, uh, stories. That, I was standing up doing a commercial, and my guests that day were Robert Goulet and Carol Lawrence, and they were engaged at the time. And uh, it was a hot summer day, and so uh, they had been told that Bobby's going to be over there doing a commercial, and she'll come over and sit down, and when she does, you'll know uh, that you could be on camera at any time. So I came over, I finished commercial, came over, sat down, and it was in the day of the miniskirt. And the director and I kind of had a thing that if the skirt was just really a little too short, we moved the flowers over a little bit and I'd kind of hide behind the flowers on the table in front. So I sat down and uh, so I had to start moving the flowers and he went to a close up of me. So now nobody has yet seen Goulet and, and Carol Lawrence. And I, uh, I'm doing the introduction, and uh, I'm trying to get the skirt to stay anchored and, you know, tucking it in under my legs. And Robert Goulet was in uh, golf shorts, and so he's mimicking me, and he's, you know, pulling at his shorts, making fun of me pulling at my skirt. Now, the audience sees none of this. The audience only sees the head of Bobby talking, ad-libbing, trying to do this introduction. And it finally, it just got all so crazy, I said. And while I am seated here, pulling down my skirt, Robert Goulet is seated next to me, pulling down his shorts. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, the whole place, we had guests in the studio. Everybody in the station, I think, came to see Robert Goulet. And, <laughs> You know, it was just pandemonium from then on. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what happened the rest of that show. <laughs> <laughs> while we're while we're talking about some of the early '60s guests that you had on Dateline, Bob Hope, who I understand you interviewed more than any other celebrity in your career, you got to interview him uh, quite early on. Tell us a little bit about the relationship you developed with Bob Hope. Well, Bob, of course, uh, when I was a kid, I loved the road movies, and so I was a big fan of, of his radio program and all. And when the opportunity, when I was called and said, how would you like to interview Bob Hope? I was in heaven, you know. So it was, the interview was on a Saturday at the SMU Coliseum. Bob was there rehearsing for a show he was doing that night. So I'd go over and... Um, and, and at that time, we were, we were filming the interviews. And uh, so uh, we sat on a stage, not unlike this, and just with our legs dangling over the side. And my husband was promotion director at the time, and he was there representing Bob's network, NBC. And uh, so uh, he was introduced to, to Bob. And so Bob, we were waiting to start, and he says, now, your name is, and I said, Bobby, and then he was struggling with my last name, and he said, I said, it's Wygant, and he said, but uh, which name is that? In other words, he meant, is that your married name or is that your on-air name? And I said, Bob, Wygant is my married name and my on-air name. I said, nobody would choose Wygant for an on-air name. <laughs> And he said, well, honey, if I can make it with this nose, you can make it with that name. <laughs> you, you developed a, a long, very close friendship with Bob Hope, and, and when he passed away, you, you had a very rare privilege. What was that? Yes, uh, we did. Um, Bob came to this area a lot, and uh, many times Dolores came with him. So I got to know both of them. And uh, a couple of times uh, that I was invited, what we were invited, 
to his home in North Hollywood for little press gatherings. And um, the first time we went to his home in North Hollywood, uh, he had a, a deal where he could, at one time it was a three holes of golf, but he sold off part of that property. Now he just was, had the, the one hole. And he would go out there and practice his golf. And uh, so we are all out there, and he's hitting golf balls. And then he looks over, and he said, oh, Bobby, yeah, come, 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 come over here. No, no, Bob, I'm in a tight skirt and high heels. Nothing would do. But Bobby would come over, and he puts the club in my hand. First time I ever held a golf club. And he wraps my fingers all around, and he says, now, just bring the club back. Forget about the ball. Just bring the club back and swing it around. I swing it back, and I swing it around. It connects to the ball and goes straight to the, the flag, the hole, and drops about two feet from the, from the hole. <laughs> now he thinks, oh, ho, you know, they're, they're making a fool of me. She's probably the women's champion of Texas. And I'm practically <laughs> on my knees saying, no, 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 I, it's my first time. I, I, I really, I've never had a golf club in my hand. And finally, he was convinced, and he looked all around the crowd, you know, waiting for him to say something. And he said, well, that does it. Tomorrow, high heels on all my golf shoes. <laughs> 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 but uh, to answer your question, um, when Bob passed away, uh, I received an invitation uh, to a memorial service and uh, to a tribute that the Academy, the Television Academy was going to pay to, to him. And it was a big fancy invitation with car passes and everything. So I called uh, his um, people, I called Fred Grant and I said, uh, I'm coming, but I have to tell you, I will not have a camera person with me. I, it'll just be me by myself. And he said, Bobby, you're not invited as press, you're invited as a friend. And so I felt very honored. But when I got there, I found out I was the only media person who was invited to those two affairs. Mm -hmm. I mean, the place was packed, but I was the only media person yeah. invited. Extraordinary. Let's go back to 1963, November 22nd, your 37th birthday. Tell us a little bit about your live Dateline broadcast that day. Of course, we knew the president was uh, coming to Fort Worth and Dallas. And uh, so, uh, but the, the Dateline program was still slotted to be 12.30 to 1. And what, what the station did, um, you have to remember now that uh, we, we didn't have instant television coverage like we have now. The, the breakfast in Fort Worth was covered live, and that's the remote truck and, you know, the live cameras and all. And then uh, for the parade, we were using film cameras, and we had two people, two camera people, uh, who were acting as reporter and camera person. And um, they were here covering the parade, and then, uh, at the trademark, we had facilities for live. And, but I was still scheduled 12.30 to 1. And they said, um, right before I went on, said, in the event that they all get to the trademark earlier than scheduled, we will cut immediately. So you may be just in the middle of something, and you'll just be chopped off, because the minute they hit there, we go live. OK. So I made that announcement uh, at the beginning that uh, if the motorcade got to the trademark early, I, I might just suddenly disappear, but the president would, would be there. So uh, we start into the first interview with Ray McKinley, a band leader, a very famous, well-known band leader, originally from Fort Worth, who was going to play a dance that night at the casino ballroom on Lake Worth. Um, so. We start into the interview, and uh, we're just a couple of minutes into it when I noticed my floor director was dancing around and pressing the headset uh, close to him and uh, giving signals that were not standard signals for anyone on camera. 
And I just was watching to the edge, what's going on? And then I saw on the monitor news bulletin. So when I saw that, I stopped talking. And uh, an off-camera voice, Tom Whalen, uh, was uh, from the newsroom, was reading uh, an announcement that said, um, our people on the scene say that uh, sounds resembling gunshots were heard in the vicinity of the motorcade and uh, the JFK motorcade. Um, we will continue to update you uh, on this. And uh, then they said to me, okay, Bobby, we're coming back to you, pick up where you left off. So that comes back to me and I just, to segue, said, do stay tuned to Channel 5, whatever new information we get, we will bring to you. And I carry on. Well, these interruptions kept happening. And even when we got into the second guest, who was um, the publisher of the All Church Press, a man of faith, Lambeth Tomlinson, and, uh, and he, uh, by this time, by the time Mr. Tomlinson came on, we knew that he had, uh, that John F. Kennedy had been hit, and John Connolly, they were both at Parkland. And uh, the president uh, seemed uh, to be um, the more seriously injured of the two. So, you know, they'd give a little announcement, Bobby, pick up where you left off. And this just continued for the whole 30 minutes. At the end of the half hour, as we were signing off, the information was that John Kennedy had been given the last rites of the Roman Catholic Church. So then it came back to me, and I said, I too am Roman Catholic, and we mustn't read too much into that because uh, that is a, a standard thing in, in the case of, of any uh, unknown situation. Um, the, the last rites are frequently given. And then signed off and sent it to the network in New York, and then at uh, six minutes after one o'clock, he was pronounced dead. What a difficult position that puts you in on live television. When you were at Purdue studying broadcasting, I imagine they didn't have scenarios like that that they put you through. No, but if they had and they'd said, now what are you going to do about it? You're in this situation. What are you going to do? I thought in nanosecond and I said, change my major to home ec. <laughs> The, the assassination, of course, affected people around the world, and, and many blame Dallas uh, because it happened here. And you traveled quite a bit in your time uh, working with, with Dateline and other programs, but you only encountered one celebrity, a very surprising one, who really blamed Dallas for the assassination. Tell us that story. It was an interview with John Belushi. And we were doing it in California, and he was there to promote uh, Saturday Night Live. And for some reason, we were standing doing the interview, and uh, so I start the interview, and he uh, introduced me, I introduced John Belushi, and he looks at me and he says, you're from Dallas, right? And I said, Dallas, Fort Worth. And he said, Dallas. And then he looked right into the, mic into the camera, and he said, Dallas the city that killed my president. And I mean, if you had stabbed me, I couldn't have been any more shocked. And I just didn't say anything for a second. And then I just uh, changed the subject because I knew in my head that was never going to make air. But I just, uh, I just had no desire to continue talking with him. So I went a minute or two and I, then I just, said thank you very much and ended the interview and he left. A couple of years later, we're, now we're doing another interview for a film. And um, so uh, we, we were in, in Los Angeles and uh, I go in and we sit down, do the inter start the interview. And uh, he says, oh, I remember you. Yeah, Dallas. And I said, Dallas, Fort Worth. And he looked into the camera again. He said, Dallas, the city that killed my president. And I just stared at him. 
I mean, you know, I, I just couldn't believe my ears. So I knew, well, that isn't going to make air, and went on and tried to do the interview. Now, another couple of years go by, <laughs> get a call <laughs> from one of the studios, and this film rep says, uh, uh, we want you to come to Chicago and do an interview with John uh, because um, he's kind of trying to change his image now and do more leading roles rather than these comedic things. And it's a movie called Continental Divide. I'd like for you to come and do an interview with him. And I said, I don't think so. And I said, you know, I, d I don't have good experiences with him. And she said, well, think about it. And uh, so a day or two later, we're talking again. I said, OK. I said, I will do it. But I said, you tell John Belushi that if he says that Dallas, the city that killed my president, I will walk and leave him sitting there. So the day of the interview in Chicago, I go to the door. They open the door. And he's standing in the doorway takes both of my hands, and he has this sheepish little grin on his face, and he says, Bobby, I'll be a good boy. I said, you better, John, because I'm, I'm, not, having any more. I'm not having any more of that. So then we start walking into the room, and uh, on the set was Blair Brown, who was his leading lady. And so she sees, and then John is kind of laughing, and he's kind of got his arm around my shoulder. And, and so as we approach Blair, she says, what are you two up to? And uh, he says, it, it, it doesn't matter, nothing. And she said, no, I want to know. What, so what are you two, what's going on here? And so we sit down, and I start the interview. And she said, never mind. She said, I want to know what this is all about. What do you two got going on here? And so John says, well, Blair, Bob doesn't like it when I look into the camera and say, Dallas, the city that killed my president. <laughs> and then he looks at me kind of like, she made me do it. <laughs> and he passed away not too long after that, right? Yes, and I was doing an interview uh, with his brother, and uh, I told him those stories. And I said, when I did the obit for John on camera, I, it was the first time I ever let that, that air. Uh, I'd, I, we'd always had edited that out. And I said um, that uh, it, it, it just shows that to John, his kind of comedy, nothing was sacred, absolutely nothing. And his brother said, it, you, you've got him sized up perfectly. He said, that's exactly what John was all about. Nothing was sacred. Many people believe that the, the mood in the country uh, was, was brightened after the Kennedy assassination by the arrival of the Beatles in February of 1964. In September of that year, you got to see them and talk to them. Uh, you want to tell us a little bit about your encounter with the Beatles and Brian Epstein? Well, I was, I was so excited because I was... I always said, I, I'm the oldest groupie the Beatles have. You know? <laughs> I loved the Beatles from, from the get-go. And um, so I was uh, contacted and said uh, that uh, I, I, if I wanted to be a part of that press conference, I would have to go and be interviewed. So several weeks before the press conference, I came for an interview. And uh, then they said, well, uh, if you're selected, you will receive an invitation. But the invitation is for you and you alone. If at the last minute you can't come, don't give the invitation to anybody else. It's because it's only for you. So anyway, I was able to go, and, and Phil dropped me off at, at the uh, Dallas Memorial Auditorium. And I go into the press conference. And um, they, they, uh, as they were getting ready to start, uh, Derek, the press manager, came out. And, uh, you know, they're all in their little outfits and all looking very British. And, and uh, he said, um, uh, here's the protocol. Uh, if you wish to ask a question, uh, you raise your hand. Uh, if you're acknowledged or when you're acknowledged, you stand, you give your name and your affiliation and state your question. You know, none of this <laughs> yelling from all directions. That would be very orderly. So about halfway through, I thought, I better, you know, get my question. And so 
raise my hand, I'm acknowledged, I stand up, and I start to say, <coughs> excuse me, I start to say my name and my affiliation, and in unison, the four Beatles said, oh, we saw you on the telly today. <laughs> so my question to them was, you are the highest paid performers in show business today. When you got that first extra bit of money that you know you could just blow on anything, what did you, what did you get for yourself? And it, it, with each one of them, it was an automobile. And they all kind of said, uh, I, one was Rolls Royce, one was Ferrari, uh, one was a Bentley. I, I don't know what the other, if there was another. Anyway, they're shouting out these names of automobiles. When the press conference was over, I wanted to go up to, um, to um, Brian. Brian, thank you, uh, Brian Epstein, and uh, to thank him for the, having the press conference. So I went up, and I did. I thanked him, and he said, um, uh, "Well, you're staying for the concert." I said, I, "I don't have a ticket." He said, "Well, then you'll just stay with me," and he took me by the arm. And uh, I watched that 1964 Beatles concert, standing at the foot of the stage over here uh, with Brian Epstein. And, um, and just... We're all so envious of you right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I tell you, it's one of the, you know, I still hear the, the girls yelling and screaming. You couldn't hear the music. You know, you, all you could hear was... And watching the Beatles, it, it was wonderful. And which one was your favorite? I would have to say Paul. I, I interviewed Paul by himself a couple of years uh, later when he made a movie. And uh, we had, well, I'll tell you when it was. It was shortly after the death uh, of when John was killed. Yeah. We have a picture of it. It was 84, exactly 20, uh, yeah, exactly 20 years after you oh, saw that. Problem. What did I say? A couple of years, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, after John's death. Yeah. yeah. Now, you got to, starting in 63, you got to go on these press trips, sometimes all around the world, very lavish, extraordinary press trips. Uh, some of them were actually a little dangerous. I, I wonder if you might tell us in particular about that press trip you took uh, to Munich, and you went to the <laughs> Munich Zoo. <laughs> went to the Munich <clears throat> Zoo for the movie Hannibal Brooks. And uh, we were a small press group, I don't know, nine, ten people. And uh, we were going to see a, a, an action scene where uh, something would catch on fire and uh, there would be action around all of that. And, but it was a fire thing. So we're waiting for that to happen. And uh, it, the fire flared up, but it got out of control. There was a little puff of wind. And they said to us, move back, move back, move back. And, and uh, the, someone behind me left his camera bag on the ground. And in backing us up, I tripped and fell. And I fell really hard. I mean, I just, you know, crashed uh, to, to <laughs> the ground. And I really was kind of dazed. I didn't hit my head. But um, I, I was a little bit stunned for a moment got up and of course immediately the studio gets, you know, they can see lawsuit and all of that stuff. So they insisted I go to a doctor. So one of the journalists and uh, one of the, the studio people took me to this doctor. And he examined and me and said, uh, well, there was no damage uh, of any consequence. It was the coccyx or tailbone, and uh, it would just have to, you know, heal itself. There wasn't anything they could do for that. And so, but he sent me across the street to get an x-ray. So I go into this place, and this huge woman, I mean, just tall, big lady, uh, in nurse's outfit, uh, spoke no English, and she motioned to me to follow her and I said, her name has to be Brunhilde. I mean, she was, you know, she is really tough. And so she took me into this tiny little closet and mimicked that I should take off my clothing. And so I look around, there is an old little gown any place, 
I'm looking, looking, no towel, nothing, nothing there, just this little cubicle. So I stripped down to just my bra and panties. And she came back, and, and nine, 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 she's shouting all over the place, you know, and you know, showing me, get all that stuff off. So then I'm, okay, whatever you say, Brunhilde. And, and so then she starts down and motions me to follow her. Everything was done, you know, like this, uh, it, with anger. And so I'm kind of all crouched over like this, walking along. And I thought, oh my gosh, she's going right by the reception room. Oh, no. <laughs> and my, my two friends are, oh, no, she wouldn't. But she did. <laughs> so I'm, I just sneak by. We go in, she takes the, the x-ray. Now we have to go back the same way. <laughs> oh, I, I was, I'm mortified, absolutely humiliated. Then I go back in, I put on my clothing and go out in the reception room and meet my buddies and we're going to the hotel. So finally I get nerve enough to say to him, I said, uh, well, what did you all do while I was, uh, you know, getting the x-ray? And they said, oh, the room next door had coffee and, and pastries. We were in there having coffee and pastries. <sighs> they didn't see it. They didn't see it. <laughs> it. It turned out later on that you really did crack something. Yes, yes, I really did. I, uh, I had a cracked a bone in, in the sacrum. And... Um, they gave me the x-rays to take to my doctor. My doctor gave them to an x-ray spe specialist, and he said, well, he said, the, the Germans, and you're just as bad, none of you saw where the break really was. <laughs> he said, hey, the break, break was here, not the coccyx. Wow, the, the things you would do for WBAP. <laughs> now, Dateline ended in 1974 after 15 years and some 10,000 guests people and or animals, and, but the, your, your career, of course, doesn't stop there because you start doing other things. You do a magazine-style show, you do news segments, you have your uh, entertainment and the arts program, and, and you continue to interview celebrities and movie stars to the point where, into the 70s and 80s, you've interviewed some of the same celebrities three, four, five times, and you start to develop a a rapport, a relationship. They start to remember you, in, including Bruce Willis. Oh, boy. Tell us about Bruce Willis. Well, when I first started uh, interviewing Bruce, he just, you know, he would cooperate very nicely. And then little by little, he started, uh, as we would have one interview after another, new film come out, he just started needling me. And, uh, and just to you know, in a teasing way, and I would kind of go along with it, and, and it was kind of made for front television. And, um, uh, but the, the needling got to be more and more uh, <laughs> aggressive, I guess it, we can say that. And then the movie Armageddon came along. And right before the movie uh, junket that we were on, he, um, uh, every magazine and paper you picked up was uh, showing Bruce as the devoted father. He was with his three girls, and they did this and they did that, and, and all this stuff about Bruce being the wonderful daddy that he was. So I started the interview that day. I said, well, Bruce, everything I pick up, your pictures of you and the three girls. And uh, I said, uh, you're very hands-on father. And he said, oh, I know, Bobby. He said, it's not like the old days when you used to come up to the canyon and we danced naked all night. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> I said, that was some other Bobby. <laughs> <laughs> and no, no, Bobby, there's no need to, you know. It's so, and he just carried it on. And he went through uh, my time segment was five minutes. He went through the whole five minutes with his dancing naked in the canyon. <laughs> so I said, okay, Bruce, I said, we've used up all the time. I don't have anything I can put on the air. Now what are we going to do? So he turns to the room producer. He says, turn off the clock. Says, I'll tell her when she leaves. Now, what do you want to ask me? And then he was willing to talk about the movie. <laughs> so 
afterwards, uh, the crew, of course, the word spread, and so the crew said, well, you got the best interview of the day. I said, oh, really, really? Uh, and I said, does he do the other journalists that way? And he said, no, just you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, occasionally you found out that, that stars were pretty big fans of yours, like uh, our, our good museum friend here, Bill Paxton, who we lost a few years ago. Oh. Uh, Bill Paxton uh, was very excited to see you, wasn't he? Bill, he was such a love, I'm telling you. Um, Bill and I never knew one another when he was in Fort Worth. Although uh, I was on TV and he saw me on TV. He was, of course, lots, lots younger than I. And then he went to Hollywood when he was quite young. And um, he wasn't uh, doing the kinds of pictures that would have press trips until he did um, the, the picture with Arnold Schwarzenegger. And uh, so uh, he saw that I was listed as one of the journalists. And he made a big to-do. He said, oh, he said, finally, I'm going to get to be interviewed by Bobby Wygant after all these years. <laughs> so comes the day of the interview, and I'm in line. And, and everybody who came in wouldn't be Bobby Wygant. It was some other journalist. And he would say to the producer in charge of the room, he'd say, and when does Bobby come in? Well, that doesn't make the journalist who's sitting there <laughs> feel too good when he's, you, you don't, you know, I'm not bothering with you right now. When does Bobby come in? So finally they came out and said, we're moving you up in the rotation. <laughs> Paxton <laughs> behave himself. So I was to go in the next one and I start to move in that direction. And he takes off his microphone and comes out and we kind of collide in the doorway, and he picks me up, and he just whirs me around and around and around. And he said, finally, after all these years, I'm getting to be interviewed by my hometown celebrity. I said, oh, Bill, please. <laughs> yeah. But he, he, was, he was a love. He yeah. really was. Uh, Bill Paxton, as many of you may know, was eight years old in Fort Worth on the day that President Kennedy came to town and was out there to see the president in front of the Hotel Texas. Uh, we lost him too soon. Uh, you have seen the nature of celebrity change quite a bit. What, what has that transition been like from when you started in the, the late 40s when celebrities were movie stars to the way it is today when the definition of celebrity is quite a bit different. What's it been like to see that transition over the decades? Difficult to keep up with it, really. Uh, and um, in, the, in the earlier days, uh, when the stars went out on tour, they were really prepped for it by the studio or their, their agents or somebody, you know, really prepped them. And now they just throw these people up on TV and uh, uh, on tours. Uh, and uh, it, it, they're just out there floundering around, <laughs> on the, uh, trying to make it on their own. Uh, it, I'm told, back in the days of, of Betty Davis and all, when they were starting, they actually, the studios had little classes on for everything, you know, and how to be interviewed by uh, a journalist, and uh, what to say and what not to say, and how to answer this question, and how to answer you know, they, they went to school for uh, handling press people. And also, back in the day, uh, the, the reporters, uh, for instance, uh, this was even a little bit before my time, but uh, reporters in the know knew that uh, Catherine Hepburn and Spencer Tracy were lovers, but they never, ever let it be you know, they never put that in print uh, out of respect to Spencer, who was married and had a family. And uh, they kept things quiet. Yeah. And uh, now, you know, uh, not only do they not keep it quiet, they, they invent things. Some journalists, uh, they call themselves journalists, uh, but uh, some of the people d don't have the, the ethics that they should. Your, your most recent celebrity interview was just last year. I understand it was Bradley Cooper. Bradley Cooper. How was yes. that? Fast. <laughs> <laughs> it was, uh, 
uh, he, he kind of breezed through town, I think, for a couple of hours. And uh, I was invited. It was a very select group uh, because he wasn't going to be here that long. Um, uh, but I had tremendous respect for him. I mean, here was uh, the movie uh, it is, uh, that was, was and is still a big hit, um, A Star is Born. Uh, he wrote the script. He directed it. He starred in it. Uh, he produced it. I mean, did he sweep up afterwards? Probably. Uh, but, uh, uh, and, and he had never directed before. And uh, it was uh, the first, uh, he maybe had written, but not something that was going to be produced. So I like, holy Toledo, this guy is dynamite. Uh, but he was very uh, cooperative and very pleasant. Uh, it was a nice three minute interview. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard you remark many times over the years that throughout your career, you've never really faced what you would ever describe as discrimination, other than equal pay for women. But surely, tra blazing that trail as you have, there must have been a few challenges being a woman in this business dominated largely by men. Is there anything that you can share with us about what that was like for you, particularly in the early days? Well, I have to tell you, I'm French-Irish. Uh, does that tell you a lot right there? I'm French-Irish. Um, that's my heritage. Um, you know, I, I never really was hassled. Uh, I was given so many jobs to do that. I, I, I really, I didn't have time to get into trouble or to have pick fights or, uh, you know, have any kind of causes that I was, uh, you know, trying to to uh, pursue um, because, uh, you know, when you're meeting deadlines every day and uh, you're responsible for getting guests and doing your own research and, and getting in there and doing a, a decent job and um, keeping clients happy and, uh, you know, uh, uh, and as far as um, any sort of, of uh, oh, you're a woman, you can't do that. Uh, I, I was one of the few people in the earliest days that really had any training. I mean, uh, you know, most people were coming from other fields, and um, and I was broadcast trained. And um, so, uh, but when it came to pay, uh, women were across the board paid less, and that that followed me uh, for many many years. But. Um, so, uh, I asked uh, uh, an executive one time, I said, what is the justification for that in, in the eyes of management? And this was just one executive's opinion. And he said, well, now we're going back to the, the 50s, 40s, 50s, 60s. He said, women are not uh, the investment that men are. Men are the breadwinners, that they are, and most of the women who work when they marry, they quit, or when they start having a family, they quit. And so uh, we don't um, feel that they are uh, the same investment that the man is, who is hopefully going to stay with the company. Hmm. And uh, that, that, was, that was the explana explanation I got at that time. I don't think that explanation would fly today, though. <laughs> but um, uh, no, no, certainly not. If you have questions for Bobby Wigan, if you'll uh, fill out those question cards that were in your chairs and pass them to the end of your rows, we will collect those. And also, uh, if you're um, not on our mailing list and would like to be, flip it on the back and put your information on there and we'll add you to our mailing list. Bobby, what advice do you give to young and aspiring journalists and broadcasters who want to follow in your footsteps? I tell them that, uh, first of all, you really have to want to be in the profession it's not an easy profession for journalists today. Uh, it, you know, I came to, to Fort Worth and Dallas and stayed my whole career, my whole life. And it's very difficult for people to do that now. I mean, they, they uh, it, you know, we, we, by the time we get a, a reporter into our system, a, as big a station as we are, you look at their resume and they've been at 
uh, smaller markets, maybe uh, in the last five years, they've been in five different small, uh, smaller markets. So, you, you know, this constant moving, moving, moving. And uh, that, that's difficult, but that's kind of what's going with the business now. And um, uh, so I tell them you have to really love the business. You, you have to look at it. I, won't, I can't think of anything else I would rather do. I want to be a reporter. Um, so then, then go for it. Uh, get as good an education as you can. And not everybody can go to Harvard and Yale, but uh, try to uh, get um, get a place that has a reputation for uh, turning out good students. So that's some of what I would say. And then, if money is your goal, forget it. <laughs> forget it. Hope you'll win the lottery instead, because uh, if uh, if your goal in life is to have a big fancy car, a big Cadillac or something, um, then, uh, you know, you read these stories about, there are a few who are in the multi-million dollar bracket, but the majority of working journalists, uh, you know, they're, they're just lucky to, to be able to have a house and send the kids to school and you know, and, and, but have a look at my life. If I had zillions of dollars, I couldn't buy some of the experiences I've had. That's the way I look at it. You're nodding your heads. <laughs> We've got a few questions here. Bobby, these folks want you to dish the dirt. They want to, <laughs> several of these want to know who your least favorite interview subject was, who your most difficult interview subject was. Let's, 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 with the difference. Tell us your favorite interview and your least favorite interview. Well, it, it's hard to just pick one interview. Uh, however, I will say that uh, one interview that always will be uh, special to me. I did an interview with a, a, a submarine commander by the name of James Calvert. He took the nuclear sub skate under the polar ice cap and surfaced at the pole. For some reason, from childhood, I had a fascination with submarines. And I had read many, many books by submarine captains. And uh, I read uh, Ned Beach, Edward Beach books uh, about his uh, being a sub commander in the Pacific Theater of War in World War II. Anyway, uh, James Calvert wrote a book. And I had the book uh, from day one that it was out and uh, read it a couple of times. And he was coming to Fort Worth to do a lecture. And I finally was able at 9.30 at night before the lecture the next morning to get in touch with him and ask him if he, I, he would come to our studio and do an interview. And he said, well, the ladies are coming for me at 10 o'clock. There is no time. I said, we can come for you at 9 o'clock. We can take you to the studio, do the interview, and get you back by a quarter of 10. And I, I, I knew I had to really talk fast and make my points. And uh, I said, I, I bought the first copy of your book in Fort Worth. I had it on order before it actually got here. And I said, and I've read every book Ned Beach ever wrote. And his name is Edward Beach, uh, but he was known as Ned. And that just rolled out of my mouth. I wasn't trying to impress the commander. But when I said Ned Beach, he said, what time do you want to pick me up in the morning? <laughs> and so I did the interview, and um, he was very complimentary and um, was amazed that I knew as much about submarines <laughs> as I did. <laughs> and so that, that's been a very special one. Now, what, what was the other part of the question? Least favorite or most difficult person you interviewed? Oh, my gosh, that's, that's easy. Gary Busey. <laughs> <laughs> You know, we really had a little dust up in one interview. I tried not to antagonize my guest, but um, he, I was interviewing him, and I said, there's something I need to get straight. Were you born in Texas and brought up in Oklahoma, or born in Oklahoma, brought up in Texas? And he said, well, if you'd read your bio, you would know that, and just real ugly to me. And I 
practically came out of my chair. And I said, I read the bio, and it isn't there, okay? I mean, just to <laughs> raised my voice like that. And the room got very tense. <laughs> you know, what's going to happen? Who's going to walk first, you know? And uh, so then he kind of calmed down when I yelled at him. But um, he, he's, I don't know. I can't explain Gary Busey. <laughs> <laughs> And yet, you know, if, if he were offered tomorrow, I'd probably do an interview with him. And I think I would start out by saying, you know, uh, why have we always been at odds with one another? <laughs> Was he born in Texas or in Oklahoma? I don't remember. <laughs> I don't know that we ever got an answer. That, that might explain everything. <laughs> I don't know that we ever got an answer. <laughs> Someone that you wanted to interview but never had the chance. Oh, Winston Churchill. I'm a big Churchill fan. You know, I go into bookstores, and I always look to see if there's anything new on Churchill. And there's a wonderful used bookstore in St. Petersburg, Florida, if you're ever there, called Haslam's, biggest used bookstore in Florida. And they always have something different uh, about Churchill. I have Churchill books to the ceiling. This is not a question, but one young man in the audience wants you to know that he had a major crush on you in the 50s. Oh, hello, who are you? <laughs> Hands up. <laughs> he, uh, he did not put a phone number on the back. As I would, as I <laughs> did you ever consider moving to uh, the network or a, a major market like LA or New York? My husband was approached many, many times uh, to work for NBC, both in New York and LA. And um, uh, neither one of us really, uh, you know, we put down roots in Texas and loved Texas and really didn't want to, to leave. But he had many opportunities. Nobody ever asked me to come to New York or LA. <laughs> Who do you admire in today's uh, media journalism? Oh boy, there, there are so many good people. Um, I think, um, well, Give me a parameter to, to work from. Uh, uh, let's, let's just talk DFW. D, D, oh, you, you're going to get me in big trouble, aren't you? <laughs> I said, we have a lot of good journalists in, in this area, and uh, some uh, who you know, are no longer with us. But I have to say that the most dedicated person I ever worked with was Harold Taft, mm -hmm. our meteorologist. Uh, you know, uh, Harold and I, uh, well, I, I always told him I had seniority over him because I started a few weeks before he did at Channel 5. <laughs> I said, remember, remember, Harold, I'm senior, I'm senior over you. But um, we were good friends, and uh, for 16 years, we uh, co-hosted the uh, telethon, right, right. the Jerry Lewis uh, MDA telethon, um, and especially after... Uh, we were no longer uh, under Carter Publications, and Lynn Broadcasting bought us. And Lynn had a whole different style of everything, of running station and everything. And uh, they really gave Harold a fit. And he would come and stand in my doorway, because I frequently worked uh, late into the night and the wee hours of the morning. And Harold would be there frequently very late stand in the doorway at, so that he could hear if his phone rang down the hall. And he would, you know, give me the latest scuttlebutt, uh, tell me, do you know what the stupid suits want me to do now? <laughs> <laughs> suits were for the management people upstairs. <laughs> and, and today, both you and, and Harold have conference rooms named in your honor at NBC5. Isn't that wonderful? I, I didn't have any idea when they first... Uh, wanted to collect some stuff, you know. They were trying not to tell me what it was for, and then finally uh, they, they did tell me what it was for. Uh, yes, there are three conference rooms in our studios uh, near uh, DFW, and um, one is for me, and one is Harold, and the, the biggest one is Eamon Carter. Of course. Yes, as it should be. <laughs> no, I, I feel... I feel very honored every time I walk past that conference room. Uh, 
Um, there's several questions along these same lines, so I'm going to try to paraphrase it. Essentially, uh, some folks in the audience want to get your take on the state of journalism today, particularly if you're discouraged by the way news is covered. I'm discouraged by the fact that people don't uh, check their sources. Like It used to be you had to have two sources. If you had something really controversial or uh, just whatever you were reporting, you, you had to have two sources. And they've backed off from that now because it's become so competitive that um, the, uh, and they will say uh, many times, um, you know, this is not confirmed. Mm -hmm. But then they go ahead and say it. It's not confirmed, but. But then when people process it in their brains, they don't put that it hasn't been confirmed. They just remember whatever it was that you were, you were putting forth. So um, I, I think it's, it has become so very competitive. The news business has become so competitive and uh, that uh, I think they, uh, there still are very uh, sincere journalists who want to everything that they put in a story to be accurate, and they work hard to try to make it so. But it's a very complicated world. When you, when you try to check sources, it, it, it can be very complicated, very time consuming, in spite of the fact that we have more ways of checking things today than we ever did. I didn't have Google back in the days when I, <laughs> I, I had a set of encyclopedia. <laughs> but I did, I, you know doing research, that was a lot more time consuming than it is now. We are running out of time, but I do want to mention your book one more time, Talking to the Stars. Uh, after the program tonight, Bobby is going to be going downstairs to our bookstore, and she'll be happy to uh, personalize uh, your copy for you. So when the program's over, if you wouldn't mind keeping your seats, we want to get her downstairs before you guys, all your, all you uh, fan folks, have a chance to rush the stage and uh, talk to her, because I know you want to. And some of the books have been, I pre-signed them. But if you want a more personalized inscription, I'll be here as long as, as you need me. The foreword of this book is written by a fellow named Bob Schieffer. Yes. And, and I understand, Bobby, that you are responsible for Bob going on television. Listen, he was just waiting to be discovered. I mean, um, yes, the very first time he was on a television program was on my dateline. And he had come back from uh, 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 several months covering the war in, in Vietnam. And I knew he had pictures and everything, and I, I knew him slightly. I called him and said, would he bring his pictures and, and uh, tell us about his experiences covering the war. And uh, he came, and he had the pictures all organized. They were slides. And um, uh, he just uh, took to it. He was as comfortable as if he'd been doing television all his life and uh, knew how to cue for the next slide and, and everything. So uh, for some reason, we taped it. I guess it was availability, his availability. And um, we looked at the tape, and I said, Bob, have you ever thought about broadcast journalism? And he said, no, but I am thinking about it. <laughs> so I went after he left to our news director, James A. Byron. I said, Mr. Byron, you have to see this interview I just did with Bob Schieffer, and I knew that they knew one another. Uh, I said, he is just made for television. And so I just opened a door. But uh, Schieffer would have been on television anyway eventually. He did pretty good for himself. With or without Bobby, he would have been on TV. Bobby, it has been a tremendous honor talking with you tonight. Please join me in thanking Bobby Wigand. Thank you. Thank you.